Well, what did you tell me? You figured you were going to get your butt kicked for. I it. forgot. All right, we got we got it live. From, from getting me connected with. I didn't tell him yet. <laughs> the weather knows. That's it. I'm telling you, it goes like wildfire. You all heard. I got him kicked out of the church. I heard. Yeah. Oh. He was talking to Pastor Carolyn the other day when we were eating somewhere. And he told her, did you hear the news that I left the church already? <laughs> hey, we're just sharing you. That's all. I'm going to start playing for a Church of God church over up 22 oh. in May. And, uh, and you're going to have lots of fun doing it. Does it look bad outside? Yes, to the north it's real yeah, bad. Yeah, Nicole's walking over. Here, she says it looks menacing here it's good, outside. But to the north it's real bad. Okay. To the north it's bad. And it's his fault. Okay. Not really. I have two well, titles here. Well, it blows in on my porch. It's going to be your Here's part. Two <laughs> you have two titles here? Technology pastor. And if something went wrong, I did it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay, I'll keep that in mind. What's blowing out here? Uh, I don't know. Is there a storm? There's a big storm north of us. North and probably yeah. now. West. It's so when you look over the mountain range towards Newport, it's really up there. Oh, All right. Nancy. Yeah, so I, it's I'm not his. Not ignoring you guys. I know we're live. I'm just yeah, the sending this out. The no, that's the Greenfield. No. The peanut butter ones should that's be at, at the on top. top. On top of what? The donut. It, the chocolate. It, Chocolate tops over here on all three of them. There is one. Okay, no, I, I got three of them. There is a top. There is one chocolate. I say I got three of them. Who knew chocolate would be so? I mean, peanut butter would be so popular. Yes, right. I was jealous when I you got that. Got one one. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy them. Yeah. <clears throat> Your job, if you see me nodding off, is to check me. Oh. Get you. Um, is that what I'm <laughs> serious? Um, okay. Because mine had, had peanut butter icing on the outside. That's yeah, how I, I got different peanut butter oh, ones. Okay. All right, so we got some prayer requests here. I got two right off the bat. Sure all sounds like death warmed over, literally. Yeah, she did. I With talked all, to her yesterday. Yeah, I talked to her a little bit ago, and I could barely understand her through the congestion. Hmm. It's, she's, it's that bad. Well, you can open up the window if you want. <clears throat> or just, we'll just make John stop talking. I'll just suck. Yeah, be, be, in. Anyone that watches this on Facebook or YouTube is going to think I don't like you. <laughs> Get your lips in. Nah. And I'm starting Barb, to play Barb said she's today. hoping she'll be here next I'm week. I'm starting to play in May at a Church of God over in Harrisburg on Sunday morning. That's what the joke is about. Oh, I see. <clears throat> up 22 by Camp World. <coughs> up near 39. Yeah. Where 39 crosses over 22. But Nancy. Up above everything. On the way to the spring fling a week, two weeks ago now, I guess. I was praying to God, and God has been nudging me all along that I should get back oh. in the play. So I said, I prayed to him. I said, if you have something in mind that you want me to do, you got to show me. Well, that evening I had supper with Pastor Dave. Mm -hmm. And I was telling him, and he said, here's a contact for you. Oh, <laughs> geez. What's that? No, I... Oh, oh, okay. All right. So any other prayer requests? I got Cheryl for being sick. Uh, Barb Peterson's hoping to be back next week. I'm not sure what's up this week, but I just got a quick message. I really hope I'll be there next week. So I'm assuming she won't be here today. But yeah, Cheryl, I had trouble understanding her through the congestion. It was, it was horrible. Well, it's just to the doctors yesterday. Yeah, that's what she's, but at least her sugar's better. Well, she said her sugar's going good. Well, good. <laughs> well, one thing or another, I guess. Yeah.
Yeah, and if you guys want a window open, just let me know. It looks pretty breezy. You might get some breeze through here. Okay. All right. All right, let's go ahead and open up in prayer. You can eat while I pray, John. No, I'll wait. <laughs> Most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for this opportunity to gather together again to delve into your word, to study Abraham, the beginning of the Jewish nation that you set up and in line brought your son through that line. Heavenly Father, I just pray that you will bless the word, pray that you will bless those that are here and those that will be watching later or that are watching now. And Heavenly Father, I bring to you right now Cheryl, as I just heard from her, and I wish I was exaggerating when I said she sounds terrible, but it's just, she sounds really rough. And I just pray, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you will just touch her and heal her. And she just has one attack after another, and if it's not the sugar, now it's the congestion, but we praise you that the sugar's doing better. We just pray, Heavenly Father, you will clear up the congestion, just get rid of the cough, and bring her back to church again to join in with us in fellowship. And Heavenly Father, I bring Barb Peterson to you too. She didn't ask for anything specific, um, just that I know she really enjoys being here. And I'm, tonight, today might be the day she's getting the tree down. And I pray, it's, oh, I pray that they show up today and just pray that everything's okay with her and that she'll be able to join us again. I know she wasn't here Sunday and Roger wasn't really specific, but said she wasn't doing well. So just pray, Heavenly Father, you know what she needs. You know what her afflictions are. And I just pray that you will touch her and heal her in whatever ways you know she needs healed. And Heavenly Father, I pray that you will be with John as he is starting to play for, who was it again? Shope's Bethel. Shope's Bethel up on 22. He's you know, back into playing the piano and playing for them during the worship time. And and we're going to miss him here unless he shows up for the 8 o'clock. But I just thank you and praise you, Lord God, that you're using his talents to glorify yourself. And just pray that he will be a blessing to Shopes as he is here. And Heavenly Father, just be with everyone that is here. Just give us a good afternoon, a good conversation. And give Nicole a safe walk over here. The skies look ominous, but I think she can walk fast enough to beat it. And we'll see. But I just pray that you will give her safety, Lord God, and just get her here and that she can join in with our study as well. Just praise you and thank you for everything that you do for us, everything you give to us, and everything you do through us. In, in the holy and precious name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Doing this has already been a blessing. Because I talked to the fellow there and invited them to come on the 6th of May. Oh, nice. And he was he told me he was going to reach out to three other churches that we dosed up in that area. Speaking of which, what's his name? Ivan Parker. Parker. Ivan Parker from the he played with the Gaithers. The Gaithers. To anyone that's online, if or anyone that's going to watch us, he will be here May sixth, and he is blessing us by not charging us the regular rate. It's going to be love offering, so please come prepared to bless him. Uh, but that's what six o'clock. Six o'clock. Six o'clock concert. Doors open at five. Doors open at 5. John will be here at 4.30, so <laughs> come and be blessed by the music. So today is Genesis 19, and we are going to look at Sodom. Uh, before we do, you guys can finish your donuts. We're going to do the Bible or the uh, devotional first. Uh, I don't want to break into John's donut time. Did you get, oh, you got your coffee. Okay. I'm going to miss you, bud. What? I'm going to miss you. You still be here Wednesdays. Wednesdays. Okay, good. Wednesday. Okay, I won't miss you then. <laughs> and Sunday night. Oh, okay. That's, well, I'll be here every other Sunday night. And maybe 8 o'clock. <laughs> don't, don't push it. <laughs> now, so last week we finished up chapter 18 with the conversation between Jesus and Abraham about saving Sodom. And we did discuss that it's not just Sodom that's in question. It's Sodom, Gomorrah. And the town that Lot did go to, though, and I forget what the name of it was, but there was at least three, and there are documented five cities that were in the plains. Um, but we also know that it was not just Sodom that was going to get destroyed. It was the cities of the plain. Um, but it was they were discussing Sodom specifically, and I'm assuming that's because Lot lived there. 
Uh, but before we get into that, though, let's continue with our devotional on walking in the will of God, or actually it's called walking in obedience. And today's we're going to start out with use what you have. And this just seems to be a topic that keeps coming. It came up the last two days at a at conference. They used the phrase, use what you have in your hand. And I know pastors done messages on use what you have in your hand. We've done devotionals on it and studies on it. But <clears throat> so I think there's a common theme. But there are so many voices out there today offering tips and tricks, promising to pave the way to success with their own how-to resources. Some resources are better than others, but it's important to use wisdom and discernment in determining whether any particular resource is right for you right now. And let's go back to David as he moves toward the battle against Goliath in 1 Samuel 17. King Saul is supportive of David's desire to fight against Goliath, but he dresses David in his own armor thinking that would be the best way for David to move forward. Now, whether intentionally or unintentionally, King Saul has a voice of manipulation in trying to achieve a certain outcome by offering his own proven strategy. Notice how David does not immediately reject the offer. He tries it out, but ultimately decides it's not going to work for him. We'll see David dressed in a suit of armor later in his life, but for this battle, he chooses what he knows and what he has in his own hands. When we begin to walk, when we begin to walk out what God is calling us to be in obedience, just like with Moses in Exodus 4, he will often ask us to notice what we have in our hands rather than giving us something new or different. 2 Peter 1.3 tells us, his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. The truth is what we need in order to walk in obedience and accomplish what God has called us to do is not what someone else has, but what we already have. It's easy to list all the things that we don't have that we think we might benefit from as we walk in obedience, but take a moment to notice what you already have. What character qualities do you have? What habits do you keep? What physical things do you hold? What relationships do you have? Take a second look and consider how these things are already a benefit to you. Bear in mind as well, the only thing worse than wondering to yourself, what if I fail? Is someone confirming your fear and telling you that you will fail? Unlike the voice of limitations, which we heard about last week, which tells you that you can't do it, or the voice of manipulation, which tells you that you don't have what it takes, the voice of intimidation tells you that you will not succeed. As Goliath basically says to David in 1 Samuel 17, you won't make it out of here alive. Our circumstances may not be as drastic, but the voices we hear can certainly paint the details to make it seem that way. Our response, like David's, should point back to the Lord rather than the details of our situation. <clears throat> David says in 1 Samuel 17, 45, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the army of Israel, whom you have defied. David makes it clear that while Goliath thinks he is fighting the flesh and blood, uh, thinks that he's fighting the flesh and blood David, the battle was actually much bigger and he is up against the Lord of armies. You might look and feel like David, a young boy with a slingshot facing a giant, but notice how his words shift the focus from his own stature and weapons to the Lord Almighty. He doesn't say, I come against you with a slingshot and five smooth stones. In fact, he doesn't mention the weapons he physically has at all. He calls out the ultimate truth. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, 
for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into my hands. And that was verse 47. We can do the same thing in our own lives. The word of God is our weapon. David used it in response to Goliath. Moses used it in response to the Israelites' fear when they were being chased by the Egyptian army. Even Jesus used it in response to the enemy in the wilderness. <clears throat> you don't need to be afraid. The Lord will fight for you. When you hear the voice of intimidation creep in, shift the focus and speak the truth out loud. The battle is the Lord's. So any questions or comments on that? Always seems much longer when I'm reading through it than when I'm preparing it. <laughs> okay, if there's no questions, then we'll. You don't always give us, get us to use what we have in our hand. Oh, he, he doesn't send us on, on trips that we know nothing about. <laughs> right. But then you find out while you're on the trip that he right. does equip you while you're right. there. Right. And a lot of times it's something that you already have that you are not utilizing or something that you didn't know you had. Right. Yeah. But that's why they say God does not call the equipped because without God's calling, none right. of us are equipped. Right. He always equips us for what he calls us for. And a lot of it is things that we don't even think about, things that we already a lot have. Of it can end up to being a big learning experience for you. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. All right. So we're going to pick up in Genesis 19 and we're going to start with verse one. Let's start at the very beginning. <laughs> but last week we saw Abraham bartering with God for the redemption of Sodom. He fully recognized God's sovereignty, but also pointed out what he knew about God being just and fair and was challenging him with whether or not he would destroy Sodom, even if they could find 50 righteous people there. Well, Abraham didn't stop there, though. He bartered all the way down to 10 people, figuring that there had to be at least 10 righteous people in that large area. You know, and like I said, I know it says Sodom, but this is incorporating the whole area. But the angels are going to check out Sodom. But especially considering that his family, well, Lot lived there with his wife and his daughters, and his daughters were engaged. So he's figuring that's at least six, or he's hoping. But we discussed how Jesus put Abraham in the know about what was going down in order to bring out the intercessor of in him, which he's going to need later on for Israel as well. Also to show Abraham more about who he was as God, as well as to set an example for the future judges of Israel, to teach them not to judge on what they've heard, but to actually go and physically seek it out, even though as God, he knows what the outcome is already. But he's showing the fact, this is how I want you to do it. So I'm going to do it as well. But when we left off, the angels had already departed for Sodom, and Abraham was headed home, apparently satisfied with the outcome of the conversation. And the last sentence actually brings to mind a question that I was asked last night, last week. But I used to refer to the angel of the Lord and other names in the Bible, but now I just say Jesus. If it's in the if it's in the Bible. I'll call it what I'll call him the angel of the Lord, you know, the messenger. I'll read the Bible verbatim. But when I'm referring to him in common in comment, it is Jesus. And I feel it just helps to set in your mind that Jesus is in the Old Testament. And that's important because when I was putting this together and that I finally realized that, I realized that that was something I was never taught. And it's something that you don't hear a lot about. And the first time I heard about it was a theological day of study that I was sick. So I really didn't, didn't get much out of it. But then when I started doing the study, I'm like, hey, wait a minute. And it's just time after time, it proves itself to be true. 
And I just think it's something very important to understand that, you know, it wasn't just God the whole time. They weren't just all together at creation. Jesus was on the earth prior to being born as a baby. Or, you know, a figure of him was. He was he's the the visual aspect of the father that we can look at. Now, and the other thing to help confirm it, since I don't believe in coincidence, is when I tried, and I, I honestly believe I miserably failed when I tried to do a devotion, a study on this, because I wasn't ready for it. But the following week, when I was leaving the Bible study, I caught Dr. David Jeremiah at eight o'clock on WDAC, and he was in the middle of a series on angels. And that night, he was doing a study on the angel of the Lord. And he was using the exact same references that I had studied and everything. So I'm like, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Even though I blew it two weeks, you know, last week, yeah. at least, you know, it's something we can build on then. But with that, then we'll delve into 19, uh, starting at verse one. The two angels arrived at Sodom in the evening and Lot was sitting in the gateway of the city. When he saw them, he got up to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. My lords, he said, please turn aside to your servant's house. You can wash your feet and spend the night and then go on your way in the morning. So these are the two angels that accompanied Jesus. Jesus did not go with them. Um, and if you remember, they departed towards Sodom while the Lord was still talking to Abraham. Not you guys. Keeps giving me email messages. So mm -hmm. But at first read, it does appear that they re they arrived the same day, only that night. And it doesn't definitively say that, but that was my assumption that they arrived that same within the same daytime. But what would make that such an interesting fact is the only source I came across that gave any indication as to the distance of travel. From Abraham's tent to Sodom, it was a two-day trip. That was just an interesting fact. I mean, it was like 35 or 40 miles. And they're saying it would have been like a two-day trip. But they made it, it sounds like, that same night. Being angels, that's not surprising. Like I said, just one of those little interesting things that you come across. They went the way the crow flies. They went by way of angel flies. <laughs> <laughs> but most of them give significance to the fact that Lot was sitting at the gateway to the city, too. And a common thought is that Lot had a position of authority, per se, and that's why he was sitting there. Um, whether it was to be a judge or an advisor to the city or some other position, but Enduring Word puts it that it indicated that he was a civil, civic leader. The gate area of an ancient city was sort of a town hall where the important men of the city judged disputes, conferred with one another, and supervised those who entered or left the city. Now, yes and no. The information that they just stated and that we, or that we received in Israel falls in line with the last part of that. It just doesn't mean the other ones aren't right, just the information that we were given was that the elders of the city, I mean, some cities had four gates, some had six, but at each gate, like, that way the people couldn't just go straight in. The gates had to be open, but this one wasn't open until this one was closed. But there were elders that determined why you were there and whether you were safe, and if you were a threat, they would dispatch you. But that is, and I actually have pictures of the gates, and it's actually being that, because the first time I did this Bible study, I had no idea. I was going off of everything I could read and what other people knew, but to actually be there and see it, I was just like, ah, I get it now, because there was actually a stone bench for them to sit on, and that's where they sat. It was kind of like they were protecting the city. Um
but yeah, the gates would be a stepped process allowing the travelers to be properly vetted, you know, before they enter into the city itself. Oh, and others, yeah, you know, others had said too, and this may be true too, that he was sitting out there because he just didn't want to take part in what they were doing in the city. I mean, we know how vile a city it was. But also, he may have been looking for travelers so that they didn't fall into the hands of the sodomites. You know, if you travel into that city, you're free game, as we'll see later on with the angels. But as it is, da -da -da. regardless of the case, we see later in the chapter that if they had not been angels, neither one of these would have mattered because they were protected anyhow. But if they weren't angels, then that it would have been a good thing for what Lot offered him. He was offering them safety is what he was offering. But it could also be, and he bowed down with his face to the ground and said, my lords, please turn aside to your servant's house. You can wash your feet and spend the night and then go on your way early in the morning. So he was offering them safety, but he was disguising it as, um, well, not disguising. He was being very um, hospitable. Thank you. But in the same, you know, hey, come on, come to my house. Quick, 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 you know. Wash your feet there, I'll give you some food and put you on your way in the morning. Well, he's calling himself their servant. Um, he's obviously is acknowledging, I mean, he might be able to tell that they are men of high honor. Yeah, he's referring to himself as their servant. Yeah. In the third person. <coughs> Yeah, please turn aside to your servant's house, meaning his, his own house. He's referring to himself as a servant so that, so that they can wash their feet and then he'll give them food and send them on their way in the morning. Sorry, I didn't catch how you were meaning that. But they answered, no, we will spend the night in the square. But he insisted so strongly that they did go with him and, and entered his house. He prepared a meal for them, baking bread without yeast, and they ate. So here again, we know the reason for his insistence, though he didn't make it known to the two travelers, but they already knew. But had he have known that they were angels, he may not have felt such a pull to protect them. But, you know, so I don't know if they didn't introduce themselves that way because they wanted to see his reaction or... But he, he could have just said, okay, I have no idea what that was. <laughs> oh, there it is. But he could have just said, okay, whatever you wish, and left it at that. And But he was genuinely concerned for their, for their well-being. But does this stand to show, <laughs> this, this is a rabbit trail. Does this stand to show that Lot is righteous? Is this the point where he was considered righteous because of doing the right thing? Or was it God just being faithful to Abraham? And it's kind of a briar, I guess you could say, because it latched onto me and I couldn't let it go. Um, but how was Lot considered righteous? Everyone, is anyone familiar with, where is it? Now, I did, now, I looked further into it. And this is where we have to watch the resources that we use, because Lot in the New Testament is referred to as a righteous man. So you see why well, I was like, really? Yeah, he chose to live in Sodom? But one source gave Lot's righteousness in reference to Noah's, where it says in Genesis 6, 9, Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time. And it explained that Lot was righteous because in comparison to the people of Sodom, he wasn't all that bad. Well, that's a worldly view of looking at sin. In my opinion, that's a worldly view of 
you're not righteous just because you're not as bad as everyone else. But what the commentary left out was that also in Genesis 9, it says that Noah walked faithfully with God. That's why he was righteous. But the commentary, and this is, this came from Kaufman's, which is one of the reasons why I don't use Kaufman's a whole lot. I'm very careful what I use. But Kaufman's was saying that Lot was righteous because he wasn't as bad as the rest of the people in Sodom. Yeah, no. <laughs> I, I don't agree with that. Well, didn't Lot choose to live there? He did. And at first, he lived outside the city. And then he moved into the city, and that's where he raised his family then. No, I'm not answering you. Oh, that's Likens. That's the Medicare line again. But no, I'm definitely not saying the same thing because the Bible does not say that Lot was righteous because he walked with God. And I'm not saying that he was not righteous either. I'm not the judge of that. What I will say is that Lot was living no differently than many Christians today. And I will say we, as this fits the way that I used to live my Christian life, we have our beliefs, we have our convictions, but do we stand up to the evil in the world and rock the boat? Do we call wrong wrong, or do we feel that as long as we're living what we're supposed to be, it doesn't matter what everyone else is doing, we don't have to answer for them, so we're not going to interfere with it either. I mean, we need to have the intercessor's heart. This kind of goes back to last week. You know, we need to intercede for them through prayer, but we also need to show our love for Christ to them, and we need to show them what's right and try to lead them without being a judgmental of them. But what I found was in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes, and made them an example of what is to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued Lot, a righteous man, who was distressed by the depraved conduct of the lawless, for that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. And that's right from the Bible. That's not commentary. So first off, it does define that Noah... It defines the difference between Noah and Lot. Um, Noah was a preacher of righteousness, and Lot was a righteous man who was distressed by the depraved conduct of the lawless. So Noah was a man who found favor in God's eyes, and he preached righteousness. And Lot was also called right, righteous, but he didn't preach that righteousness. It was just that he was distressed by everything going on. So his cries were some of the cries that were going up to the Lord also. But then when we got to verse 9, we found out there may have been evidence of when we get to verse 9. We find out that there may have been evidence of Lot speaking out against the vile nature of the inhabitants. But it never specifically states that he preached against it. Just that he was acting as a judge. And we also know from later verses that Lot's family did not live as the people of Sodom because his daughters were betrothed and they were still virgins. So was Lot considered righteous? I mean, the Bible says he was. Peter says he was. You know, but was he considered righteous? And saved from the destruction that befell Sodom because he was living his convictions at home and was not partaking in the abominations that were prevalent in the city? Or does it still go back to the fact that God's just being faithful to Abraham? Well, exactly. But I mean, it's something, you know, something to think about, something just a rabbit trail to think about, too. You know, we're not judging, we're just discussing it. But as we do see later on, Lot was living out his convictions privately. But that poses a serious problem for him with the mob that shows up.
But uh, we're going to go ahead and continue on with verse four before I ruin everything else. I do it for some reason. I did a lot of jumping ahead. So picking up in verse four, before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. They called to Lot, where are those men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we can have sex with them. I don't think there's very much that needs to be said. They weren't speaking in code. I mean, they came right out and said what their intentions were. But I'd also like to point out two things. All of the men from Sodom, every part of the city, both young and old. So it wasn't just a crowd of them. It wasn't just the able-bodied one. It was they all, every single male from the city came to do take part in this. <clears throat> well, and that's the thing back in the, you know, the women probably didn't, weren't allowed to take part in it. <clears throat> but just like with the feeding of the 5,000, that was 5,000 men. That didn't include the women and children. That's the way things were written. I think we discussed that last night. <clears throat> Excuse me. The young as well as the old is what confuses me. Why couldn't it allow young boys? If, if, if that's uh, I mean, by young, they may have meant the teenagers. I'm, yeah. They could have been into pedophilia, too, as, as raunchy as Sodom was. I mean, there were no, no holes barred, and that's, you know, pun intended. You know, it, it, was, it was a free for all in the city. But every, it says every male, both young and old. So it was all inclusive. But this also denotes that there were not 10 righteous people in the city. Because just like with the feeding of the 5,000, when it gives the number of the 5,000, that's just the men. They didn't count the women and children, so they're all included in there too. So by counting all the men, young and old, that is indicative of the entire city so you have no other righteous people in the city so that's kind of bye-bye yeah i i wish i knew what the the number of people that live there yeah imagine all the men in harrisburg gathering around one house and trying to break down the door and imagine you're the visitor but picking up in verse 6, Lot went outside to meet them and shut the door behind him. He said, no, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. Look, I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you and you can do what you'd like with them. But don't do anything to these men for they have come under the protection of my roof. Well, and uh, I I did a lot of studying on that one, too. And, and there's different thoughts on it. You can pick and choose. So he goes out to try to calm the crowds and he even calls them friends. You know, try to start on a positive note, which is cool. I'm sure they were. Uh, yeah, I'm sure they were. I mean, they let him live there. So <clears throat> At some, they probably, he probably wasn't their favorite. But he refers to their intention as wicked and asks them, not to go through with it. The problem with this is that Lot's idea of wicked was so much different than that of the men of Sodom. So their perception would have been that if it feels good, do it. You know, the old Nike. But that would not have looked, they would not have looked at it as wicked as this was the social norm. And I mean, look at the world today. Is it so much different? I mean, any, the social norm today is if it feels good, do it. Well, why, why would the caller would have been fighting for the rape of a, two men different <clears throat> than the rape of two daughters? Well, we're getting there. We're know, getting there. Flesh and blood. We're getting there. But he also put out there that they have, that they, the two visitors came under the protection of his roof. And the importance of this that I found is that when you invite someone into your house, you're guaranteeing, in this culture, you're guaranteeing them more safety than your own family. You're inviting them in under the understanding that you will give anything to protect them, even above and beyond your own family. 
That was the culture. I mean, once again, he didn't try to ensure their safety because of any knowledge as to. Well, I saw Greg left. I thought it was Greg left. Who left? Greg, Greg, he wasn't here. No. I'm goofy. <laughs> well, I talked to him in the place was late, and I said, when you were at the Bible study, he said, yeah. <laughs> he might have been, he might have met Mondays. I thought he came today. Yeah. I, when I'm around old people, I get like that. <laughs> Pick for yourself. Wait, no, wait. Pick for yourself. And now you said, but you're not old. I said, I just listen for two hours and I end it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Harry's 95. I came to see if there's. Yeah, it it should be at least one. I think they're on the bottom. <laughs> I think that's Bavarian. The three, those three are, or two of them are Bavarian. But this, this is. Cream filled here. I got I had three cream filled all together. I had three cream filled, three Bavarian, three peanut butter. I had a Bavarian. Two, two glazed and a sugar. Oh, well, then that's okay with the three cream. But you can have one of my Bavarian. Peanut butter. <laughs> All right. Well, this is one of the parts that I do have a problem with that, where he offers up his virgin daughters, obviously, uh, to appease the crowd. He tells them that he will send them out and that he they can do what they want with them. Um, so many thoughts on this, and I'll give you two of them. One is that he knew the crowd would not want his daughters. So he made the offer to show the appeasement and kind of was hoping they wouldn't call us bluff. But John Gill's commentary, nothing can be said to excuse this good man but the hurry of spirit and confusion of mind that he was in, not knowing what to say or do to prevent, prevent the base design of those men, that he might pretty certain they would not accept his offer, their lust burning more after men than women. This is... This, that this showed his great regard to the laws of hospitality, that he had rather sacrifice his daughters to their brutal lust than give up the men that were in the house to them, and that he might hope that this would soften their minds and put them off of any further attempt. But after all, it must be condemned as a dangerous and imprudent action. I mean, I, I agree that it was dangerous either way. But like I said, different time, different culture, different, you know, things were different back then. And we, we're going we're gonna to struggle understanding it because we didn't live back then. You know, but I'm not sure how empty his offer would, I'm not sure how an empty offer would have appeased the entire mob, considering that they're still not getting what they want. But either way, if this was the case, that was truly risky to hope that they wouldn't take him up on it. Second, to look at the social standing at the time, women were of no true importance socially. This is not speaking for biblical teachings, just for the social standings at the time. That's how it was. And that being said, the safety of others in your house was of such importance that it would supersede the safety of the others in your household. And that's what I had brought up earlier. We're going to skip. Uh, David Guzik says, we understand this terrible description a little more when we consider the low place of women in the pre-Christian world and the very high place of any guests in one's house. Under the sacred obligations of hospitality, it was often understood that a guest was to be protected more than one's own family. That doesn't make me sleep any better at night, <laughs> but that's how it was. You know, we can't judge because obviously we can't change anything anyhow. And it's not for us to judge. That's just like if the world's still around 2,000 years from now and they look back at the things we do, they're going to go, what were they thinking? Because it's not going to make sense 2,000 years from now either. 
Okay. Lot was trying to protect these two men. Right. They're angels. They could strike anyone down. Why why not let them protect themselves as a because he didn't know they were angels at this time. But, he knew that they were men of respect and high honor. Because he was offering his service to them. Just like Abraham bowed to the ground, not knowing that they were angels and Jesus originally, he bowed in hospitality. Yeah, but he should have had a clue that they were. Who, Lot? Yeah. He was sitting out in front of the city and two people just came walking into the city. He was out there and he was his intent was to protect them from the men of the city. They didn't introduce themselves as angels. Eventually, Abraham figured out that you know, right. the angels were left a lot of just dumb. No dumber than Abraham. I mean, he didn't introduce, they didn't introduce themselves to Abraham as angels and Jesus, but he figured it out, and so does Lot. But not right now, he didn't. He's just going with the social norm right now, and the social norm was to protect guests above and beyond your own family. And especially if they were men. That's just the way it was. And they didn't show up with wings and halos, right? Right. That's now, it. yeah, no. I mean they may have flown there, but they tucked the tucked the wings when they went in, I guess. <laughs> but again, he uh getting into verse nine. <clears throat> here's the point that I spoke of earlier when I said that Lot living his convictions privately will cause problems for him. Verse 9, get out of the way, they replied. This fellow came here as a foreigner, and now he wants to play the judge. We'll treat you worse than them. They kept bringing pressure on Lot and moved forward to break down the door. And what I spoke of in reference to Lot, that they may have tried to, he may have tried to witness to them, is even more prevalent in the New King James Version because it says the same verse. And they said, stand back. Then they said, this one came in to stay here, and he keeps acting as a judge. Now we will deal worse with him than with them. So the difference is, the NIV says he wants to play judge, and the New King James Version points out that he kept trying to be the judge. So there is some indication that he has stepped up before. But obviously, it wasn't enough to make a difference. I, mean, I personally would have left, but that's just me. Maybe I wouldn't have. I don't know. Oh, there's the rain. Hey, you made it just in time. <laughs> but, he, I mean, like I said, he may have tried, or he may just be speaking up now because of his guests. And he's so desperate to try to protect them. But like I said, they did. It does indicate that he had tried before, so <clears throat> maybe I'll be a little easier on him. I I still don't have an answer for that one. I, I'm assuming because, like Peter said, Peter said he was a righteous man, and then stated that because the vile things of the city, he endured them day after day, and it it broke his heart really. So it may be because he had a heart for God, but he didn't walk in God's footsteps except in his own house. I yes, I. How much money he would have had to move? Like nowadays, he can't just really move out of our houses, out of. Right, but I'm sure he still had his tent. He could have just moved out of the city again, or could have moved back in with Abraham. I thought it was crowded with Abraham. It was, but. They could have worked something out. Lot could have left all his animals there. <laughs> but whether or not Lot held any position or type of position in the city is questionable. Um, you find different thoughts on. You know, like I said, I, I'm going with what they told me in Israel is that he was probably an elder of the city. So, but he, you know. But they have no respect for him or his convictions. They have no shame in letting him know their intentions, and they even threaten to do worse to him if
if he doesn't step aside. I'd like to, one quote from Enduring Words, really interesting is, and this makes you look at Christians in today's society too. The life of Lot shows us that it is possible to have a saved soul and a wasted life. Lot would be rescued, but his life would accomplish nothing. And that brings up 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15. And this is in reference to the judgment seat of Christ that the Christians will stand to. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as though through fire. So if we're saved, we're going to heaven. Oh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I can write it down here. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15. And it, 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 it starts before that, but Paul is speaking of the judgment seat of Christ. You know, and if we have built our lives on the foundation of Christ and we're saved, we believe and we're saved, we give our life to him, but we don't do anything else to promote him. We're still saved when we stand in front of him at the judgment seat. We still get into heaven, but we're going to miss out on all the the crown of life we're you know we're going to receive no benefits not that we're doing anything for benefits but to imagine the honor of having a crown to throw at the feet of christ and imagine now you're the one standing back there watching everyone else do it because you didn't live your life for christ you were saved but you did nothing with your life so on the same thing that'd be the same thing i mean it's the time frame doesn't matter it's what you've done with your life after you were saved you don't obviously your actions don't get you saved and we've hit this before though but once you're saved you should want to do things your 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 faith should increase your actions and if it doesn't then you're still saved but just kind of like somebody who skipped through the fire and got out just in time. And that, that's one that I did a lot of research because I never understood that, never understood it. But when you start looking at it and then you start cross-referencing and you realize Paul's actually speaking of the judgment seat of Christ at that time. Because then it goes on to say that, well, let me bring up, I, I, not to get sidetracked, but 1 Corinthians Chapter 3. Here, Corinthians, there they are. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Come on back. Where's my screen? There it is. And that's verse 15. <clears throat> Insurance, it, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I and mean, being saved is fire insurance, but then you should also go above and beyond that. But here it talks about your deeds. If what has been built survives, well, we'll go back a little further. <clears throat> Paul speaking of the foundation of Christ that he has laid. He laid the foundation of Christ that they are to build on that foundation. And says that nobody else can lay a foundation other than the one that's already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be showed for what it is. So if you're using the good things to build on it, it'll be shown. It'll be protected from the fire of judgment. But if you're using wood hay and straw you're using just the bare minimums to get through it'll get burned up because the day will bring it to light <clears throat> it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test the quality of each person's work if what has been built survives the builder will receive a reward if it is burned up the builder will suffer loss 
but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flame. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? Uh, bear with them. Okay, but the rest of what I was looking for is somewhere else. Sorry. I got my Corinthians mixed up. Um, what I was looking for, though, is where it talks about the time of completion. The time of completion is also when we're taken up. Because then, and I would, oh, do you remember where that is? I know we've had discussions on this. The day of completion? Yeah, it talks about, the, and it says, oh, um, what you see now, as in, so as, okay. It says about what you see now as through a mirror, you will see face to face then. It just, I guess I'm looking at that as just another example of Paul talking about the end times, the rapture. You know, the time of completion is always when we're in heaven. Totally botched that up because I had the wrong verse. I'm sorry. But this is still what it is. It is the judgment seat of Christ that we will all stand in front of as Christians. You know, we're saved, we get in. The benefits we receive depends on what we've done to further the kingdom. But we're going to go ahead and continue on with verse 10. But the men inside reached out and pulled Lot back into the house and shut the door. Then they struck the men who were at the door of the house, young and old, with blindness so that they could not find the door. The two men said to Lot, Do you have anyone else here, sons-in-laws, sons and daughters, or anyone else in the city who belongs to you? Get them out of here because we are going to destroy this place. The outcry to the Lord against his people is so great that he has sent us to destroy it. Now he knows he's talking to angels. If he doesn't, then he's, you know, kind of explains why he's living in Sodom still. But, you know, he knows now what's going on. You know, now he knows who he's invited into the house. He knows the reason for their visit. And thirdly, he knows what has to be done. But also from this passage, we see that Jesus was not one of them. This is specifically the two angels that accompany Jesus. And I was kind of always confused about that until I actually started reading it for what it is. You know, the Lord sent them. So that is the two angels. Right. And the angels were given the authority to destroy the place. But once they asked in verse 12, do you have anyone else? You know, they were shown that they were not omniscient. They did not have all knowingness. I'm sure they knew why they were there, but they wanted, you know, they they couldn't tell. They they couldn't say, okay, we know that you have da 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 da, because they don't have the omniscience of God. So they're just making sure to let him know. Anyone that belongs to you, get him out now, because we're going to destroy this place. And now this is really important telltale of how living our lives as Christ followers or lack of living our lives that way is viewed by those around us. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who were pledged to marry his daughters. It's picking up in 14. He said, hurry and get out of this place because the Lord is about to destroy the city. But his sons-in-law thought he was joking. Well, they say better late than never, but this speaks to the opposite. I mean, Lot is trying to do what is right now and save the men that are promised to his daughters. But they think he's joking because he's never. I mean, obviously, this is like, oh, whoa, what are you talking about? He, none of this was ever important before. Why is it now? You know, but I can equate this to working at the bakery when I worked there. One of the hardest parts to me about succumbing to God's will when I started into the ministry was the fact that they all knew who I was before that. You know, I was just like the rest of them. Everyone knew to come to me if they had questions pertaining to the Bible or God because they knew I went to church. 
but at the same time, I was just being a convenient Google for them. You know, they knew that I'd have the answer for them, but that was it. They knew that also enjoyed all the same raunchy jokes. I did everything that I would never do. There's things I did then I can't, I, I'm appalled by now. I, I can't even, but not to mention that I demanded their respect by, by verbally putting them down very bad. So they didn't actually respect me. They more feared me because I was very loud. Well, the same two things. You know, if you mess up after your stage, you know, and you wake up and come back. Right. The people who know you messed up after you were stage, some people never let you forget it. And well, and as God yep. says, he removes it as far as, as, far as east is from, from the west. west. People do, yeah. And that was that was one of the reasons why when I started into the ministry, I made sure everyone at the bakery knew it. Because I knew the minute I messed up, they'd be the first ones to tell me about it. So that kind of prompted me to stick to what I knew. Because the minute they, they'd egg me on, egg me on, the minute I slipped, they're like, uh-huh, how's the pastor going for you? I'm going to move this before I start typing something. <laughs> but when I started to live my life the way that Christ wanted me to, it was hard for them to take me seriously. And what actually brought me around, God used the nights of the 21st century to show me that the way that I was living my life at work, at home, as a father, everything was just completely wrong. And I was really convicted by that. And as God changed me, they still tried to egg me on to get me to slip up because they just thought it was funny. They really thought it was funny when I yelled at people. So that was the hardest thing for me to get rid of. And that was over five years ago, though. And although there's still moments where the old me tries to slip out, you know, I know, I know that's not who I am now. I know that's not who God wants me to be. And if I let that happen and somebody catches me, then I'm shaming God. And that's one of the biggest convictions, you know, you know that when you mess up now and they're looking at you going, uh-huh, how's that God thing working for you? I talk about feeling pretty low. But point is, though, we need to live our lives as Christ followers to be set apart from the world. We need to share the gospel, not just in word, but through example. Not just a do as I say, do as, you know, do as I say, not as I do. And that doesn't work with the Christian world because they're so ready to point out your flaws. You know, we're not allowed to be judgmental, but they are. But I'm actually going to read through the rest of the chapter because it's really interesting. And if you have time and you want to, Reread over the rest of the chapter at home and tell me what you get out of it. Because it's just kind of like a, it hits you really hard if you've never really looked at it. But picking up in verse 15, and it goes through, wow, 38. So we're, we're going to read the rest of this and then we'll close in prayer. With the coming of dawn, the angels urged Lot, saying, Hurry, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away when the city is punished. When he hesitated, the men grasped his hand and the hands of his wife and his two daughters and led them safely out of the city, for the Lord was merciful to them. As soon as they had brought them out, one of them said, Flee for your lives. Don't look back and don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains or you will be swept away. But Lot said to them, No, my lords, please. Your servant has found favor in your eyes, and you have shown great kindness to me in sparing my life. But I can't flee to the mountains. This disaster will overtake me and I'll die. Look, here is a town near enough to run to, and it is small. Let me flee to it. It is a very, it is very small, isn't it? Then my life will be spared. He said to them, he, 
the angel said to him, very well, I will grant this request too. I will not overthrow that town you speak of. So right there is where we see at least a third town that was going to be destroyed. But because of Lot's request, it's not now. But flee there quickly because I cannot do anything until you reach it. That is why the town is called Zor, because Zor means small. By the time Lot reached Zor, the sun had risen over the land. Then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the uh, from the Lord out of the heavens. Thus he overthrew those cities and the entire plain, destroying all those living in the cities and also the vegetation in the land. But Lot's wife looked back and she became a pillar of salt. Early the next morning Abraham got up and returned to the place where he had stood before the Lord. He looked down towards Sodom and Gomorrah, toward all the land and the plains, and he saw dense smoke rising from the land like smoke from a furnace. So when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he remembered Abraham, and he brought Lot out of the catastrophe that overthrew those cities where Lot had lived. Lot and his daughters. And I'm going to add a little ditty to this before I read it. This kind of shows us that maybe Lot was not teaching his family. And you'll see that by the reaction of his daughters. Lot and his two daughters left Zor and settled in the mountain, for he was afraid to stay in Zor. He and his two daughters lived in a cave. One day the older daughter said to the younger, Our father is old. And there is no man around here to give us children, as is the custom all over the earth. Let's get our father to drink wine and then sleep with him and preserve our family line through our father. That night, they got their father to drink wine, and the oldest daughter went in and slept with him. He was not aware of it when she laid down or when she got up. The next day, the older daughter said to the younger, Last night I slept with father. Let's get him to drink wine again tonight, and you go in and sleep with him, so that we can preserve our family line through our father. So they got their father to drink wine that night also, and the younger daughter went in and slept with him. Again, he was not aware of it when she lay down or when she got up. So both of Lot's daughters became pregnant by their father. The older daughter had a son, and she named him Moab. He is the father of the Moabites of today. The younger daughter also had a son, and she named him Ben-Ami. He is the father of the Amorites of today. Now, the interesting part about that is if you research the Ammonites and the Moabites, they are both people that went to war with Israel. So once again, family is fighting family because the youngest daughter, her son was ben and the oldest daughter, her son was Moab. They are, for all intent and purposes, related to Ishmael and Isaac because Lot was Abraham's nephew. So, and we already see the discrepancy be sorry, between Ishmael and Isaac. Now we have these two, and they're going to be going to war against Israel in the future. Sorry. So Lot is technically not a descendant of Abraham, then. Well, Lot is a relative of Abraham. He's a nephew. So distant family. So. But not the Israelites that God promised. No, just um, in relation to the fact that Lot was a nephew to Abraham. So Lot was technically related to Isaac and Lot's children slash grandchildren now. Sounds like Perry County <laughs> are related to Isaac. 
So not only do we have Ishmael and Isaac for a lifetime fighting, we have these two coming up against Israel as well. And I'll act, I, I'll act, I'm actually going to research that. I didn't research it the last time, but I'll actually bring out the scripture that shows that they fought with Israel. And it's just, like I said, it's just amazing how the decisions we make can ultimately affect things in the future. They're not just immediate. Again, you know, I mean, 4,000 years for Ishmael and Isaac <laughs> to be battling. Yeah, but, yes. Well, like, I was always under the impression that they were running at the time that she looked back. I didn't realize that they had stopped. Well, they, they didn't. Um, <clears throat> sorry, let me... They said they reached somewhere and then she looked back. The Lord laid down burning salt from the Lord out of the heavens. Thus he overthrew those cities in the entire plain, destroying all those living in the cities. And also the vegetation, but Lot's wife looked back and she became a pillar of salt. So she, they were safely in the in the city of Zor. Zor. When it. Right, but they were told, "Do not look back." Safely. It the, doesn't matter. They were told not to look back. We can't take our interpretation of God's word and make it make yeah, you know, just because. Well, we were already here, so it doesn't matter. Well, it does matter because they were told, do not look back. That is, and I have actually heard it explained once, that she looked back in despair because she just lost everything that she had. But God just saved her life. But then she went against God by looking back. It ran into, I mean, I'd have to look that up again, but they, they put it in the context of she was looking back in despair. And we do that a lot of times, too. When God brings us out of something, how many times do we look back and go, I mean, I, there's times I look back and I miss my old life because I had a lot of fun. But it's not stuff that I should consider fun nowadays. And, <clears throat> no, he's not. <clears throat> But they were told, she was told not to look back. They were all told not to look back. And she did. God didn't say don't look back until you get to the city. They were told do not look back. And notice she was the only one that didn't listen. I mean, if it would have been okay, they all probably would have looked back. Just to see, I, I would have been tempted to look back just to see what was happening. Exactly. But they were specifically told not to. And that's just plain and simple. They were told not to. I, it's kind of funny, actually. A bunch of years ago, somebody put an article out that they actually found a pillar of salt that was in a shape of a woman. Mm -hmm. And they said it was her. Hmm. I'm like, you know, that is just so absurd. <laughs> but they, they claimed to have, <clears throat> they found it in a lost city or something. The things you can find. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> uh, they supposedly this was found in the plains. They they dug up all the ruins and everything and verified this, and then they found a woman shaped, a pillar of salt shaped, and you know, it's like okay, well the Bible never said she turned into a statue. <laughs> it's, it's kind of like um, the poor guy was trying to save the archers, you know, it was from falling and he reached out and touched it to keep it from falling. Oh, the ark, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He said, <clears throat> touch it. Don't, they were and told not did. to touch it. And it doesn't and matter what your intention. to be helpful. Yeah, it doesn't matter what your intentions are. Uh -huh. God's word is God's word is God's word. Regardless of what your intentions are, you know, there's just, 
All right, well, we will finish up, and you guys are going to get a bonus on this. I never actually finished the rest of this chapter the last time I did Abraham. Because I took like a month off, and I just never came back to it. I went into a Romans Bible study. But if you guys would like, we'll just keep going with Abraham. I'm actually curious to see how far it goes. <laughs> It'll be all new to me again, too, so. So we'll go ahead and go to prayer. Hey, the rain stopped. Now it's going to snow. <laughs> Most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the, for your word, for this, the studies that we can bring out of your word, the conversations we can get into, the different avenues that we can look at. And I just thank you for your guidance in all those directions, Lord God. Just thank you for those who are here today, for those who are going to be watching this later on as well. Just pray, Lord, that you will just bless everyone through this study and just bless your word every time we speak it, Lord God. Just thank you in holy and precious name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Where can you get this live stream? It this one here specifically is only on my Facebook because I'm not live streaming on the churches. Right. But I also have a, fa a YouTube page that I'm putting them on now too. And that is what? Is it a secret? No, it's not a secret. Um, you have email or? Yeah. Do you have Facebook? Yes. Why don't I have you on my? Do I have you on my Facebook? Oh wait, I'm still 